Good morning. How are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. I'm one of the co-founders here at Red Chip Poker, and allow me to be the first to introduce you to season six of the podcast. In case you missed the previous trailer episode, a little bit of context about season six. Season six was originally released exclusively for core and pro members who have had access to it all year long with episodes getting dropped every couple of weeks. And we're going to be doing the exact same thing for season seven, starting up in January 2024, which somehow is right around the corner. Still not sure that I believe that the year is going that fast, but it is, and I guess there's no stopping it. So the plan as it stands right now is to start releasing all of season six dripped out every week or so, give or take. So make sure you're subscribed and wherever the heck you subscribe on YouTube, on your favorite podcast playing app, whatever works best for you, we will be releasing episodes slowly but surely. And if you're already a core or a pro member, you'll be getting season seven starting up soon. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk about what's coming up in season six, because we have some really good episodes episodes, including this one called Pseudo Balance. We also have episodes called Red Line Rampage. We have ICM Explained. Very, very good if you're a tournament player. We have GTO Seabedding. We have Knit Colonies. We have Gray Areas, Multi-Tabling, Modern HUD, Big Blind Leaks, Small Blind Leaks, and lots of other topics getting covered as well. So again, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a single episode when it comes out. And I think that's enough for announcements for this episode. Thank you so much for hanging out. This is season six. I'm gonna kick it over to Coach Weasel and let's fire up with this episode called Pseudo Balance. What is up, guys? Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. We're going to be talking about a concept that I refer to as pseudo balance. So, first of all, what is pseudo balance? It refers to partial balance, but not full GTO balance. So to think about an example of pseudo balance, imagine you're playing at a table against an opponent who never ever bluffs a river. It's always a value hand. Generating the counter exploit against that strategy is fairly straightforward. We just don't call any bluff catchers. We only call with hands that can dominate a certain portion of our opponent's river value betting range. Now what happens if that opponent who never bluffs suddenly shows up with a bluff on the river. All of a sudden, things get a lot more complex. Has our opponent suddenly started bluffing? Perhaps he was bluffing all along, we just didn't realize it. If he has been bluffing all along, what exactly is the frequency? What is the bluff to value ratio on that river bluff? Is it 90% value, 10% bluffs? Is it 80-20? Is he maybe playing a balanced bluff to value ratio we just coincidentally didn't see any of his bluffs in the past. We only saw the value hands. You can see that that introduction of a single bluff has made our counter strategy much less straightforward. You see, it's one thing if our opponent never bluffs, that's easy to play against. But now we know that there's a non-zero amount of bluffing going on on the river. And we kind of need to figure out what the frequency is. What is the bluff to value ratio? We need to know if our opponent's bluffing more than he should be or less than he should be in order to generate a counter strategy. The problem with that, figuring out frequencies takes a large sample size of hands. It doesn't necessarily take a large sample to figure out that our opponent never bluffs or bluffs like crazy. But if we're not sure and it's somewhere in the middle, we actually need to play a large amount of volume against an individual opponent before we can figure out what his precise bluff to value ratio is. So we can use the term pseudo balance to describe our opponent's strategy. So our opponent might not be balanced, but he's pseudo balanced. And to flip that on its head, even if we were a player who really didn't like bluffing the river very much, even if we were to only bluff 5% of the time, and some of the time our opponent would see that hand at showdown, it's going to make us much tougher to play against because although we might know we're only bluffing 5% of the time, our opponents won't know that. They won't know our precise frequency until they've played a large sample size of hands against us. So let's now take this concept of pseudo balance and see how we can apply it to our strategy on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd like you to imagine a pre-flop situation and playing against an opponent who is folding clearly too much to three bets. Let's say he's folding 70% or more of the time to three bets, and we can actually three bet our opponent from every single position at the table. So here's the question. Should we three bet 100% of our opponent's opens? We know that it's plus EV, but the issue is that it starts to become obvious. 
after we've three bet our opponents open four or five times in a row, we start wondering if he's going to figure out what we're actually doing. So if we look purely at the maths in a vacuum, so we'll refer to this as vacuumed maths. It doesn't take into account any history or any future. It purely looks at the expectation of the current situation. Then vacuumed maths says we should always continue to three bet against every single one of our opponent's opens. Of course, we can't help but wonder whether that's true in reality, because what happens if the fifth or sixth time we pull the trigger on the three bet, our opponent starts to figure out that we are deliberately targeting him, he starts to play back. See, when we factor in future play as part of our EV calculation, then it might not actually be the highest EV approach to just always three bet our opponent with any two cards 100% of the time. So if we take an extreme example where if we start three betting our opponents open more than let's say 75% of the time, he adjusts. And the reason the example is extreme is we'll say that he adjusts and suddenly starts playing like a perfect GTO opponent. Well, that's obviously a non-favorable adjustment for us. The highest EV thing to do in that case is to three bet, but not make it too obvious. Maybe three bet 75% of the time, sometimes fold, well, three bet aggressively enough that we fly below our opponent's radar. So we're constantly skimming additional chips off the top, but we're not alerting our opponent to the fact that he's being exploited and he won't make the relevant counter adjustment. So really the concept here is that we can never really know the best play in a given situation without thinking about our future expectation. We're thinking about the current game state and how that might change if we were to hypothetically push an exploit very hard and alert our opponent to the fact that he is being exploited. Now, the answer is not always going to be the same. And in most cases, our opponent is not necessarily going to revert to a perfect GTO strategy if he figures he's being exploited. In some cases, the adjustment our opponent makes against perceived exploitation is to actually play worse. So maybe our opponent figures that he is being three bet too much and he decides to spaz out and make some really questionable decisions as a result. So by provoking an adjustment in our opponent's game, the future EV could technically be higher because now our opponent is frustrated and he's actually playing worse poker. The problem is we don't really know. We don't really know whether if we provoke an adjustment in our opponent's game, whether that adjustment is going to make our opponent's game stronger or make it weaker. And we can use the analogy of the golden goose. So the idea is that we have a goose, or so the proverb goes. I'm not sure of the origins of the proverb, but the idea is we have a golden goose and that golden goose is worth a lot of money. In fact, if we sold that golden goose, we'd make millions of dollars because it's made of solid gold. I'm not really sure what the going rate of gold is, but let's just say this goose is worth millions of dollars. But the idea behind this golden goose is it also periodically lays golden eggs. It's a living goose, by the way, and it lays golden eggs. So the idea is if we hold on to the goose, we can just harvest these eggs every so often, sell those eggs, and we have a consistent and reliable source of income. If we sell the goose, yeah, we might make a short-term injection of cash, but the problem is we've lost the ability to continue making money through those golden eggs. So hopefully you can see how the analogy applies here. Imagine we have a consistent exploit. Our opponent folds too much to three bets, for example. And so long as we don't make it too obvious what we're doing, we have a consistent source of profit. It might be tempting to increase our three bet frequency and generate more money in the short term, but the end result of that could be a complete loss of our consistent exploit. Now, in many cases, the threat of an exploit disappearing is not as dangerous or likely as it might sound. And the reason for that is our opponents are often very non-reactive and bad at adjusting. So there's two different situations there. Number one is they just don't react. So now we're three betting our opponent 100% of the time. Maybe there's a dim voice in the back of our opponent's head telling him that he's probably being exploited, but he doesn't do anything about it. And that's because maybe he has a set of preflop ranges he's following and he wants to stick to those no matter what. So while we are an annoyance to our opponent, he continues to fold anyway. 
The other scenario there is that our opponent does adjust, but he adjusts in a way which is actually more profitable for us because he starts playing worse as a result. But we don't want to assume necessarily that our opponent is not going to adjust, and if he adjusts, he'll adjust badly. In some cases, our opponent might make a profitable adjustment against us, which decreases the size of the exploit we have against our opponent. So it starts to become a question regarding whether it will be profitable for us to change game states. In other words, do we want to maintain the current exploit and try and keep things fairly low key but consistent? Or do we want to try and provoke a response in our opponent's strategy? This will allow us to push the exploit a bit harder, but it's going to potentially result in a change of game state. And the problem is we don't know exactly what that change in game state will be. Our opponent might play worse against us. He might play better. We just don't know. Now, is it worth doing that? Should we change or let's call it trading game states? Should we trade our current state for a future somewhat unknown game state? And as a really general answer, the answer is no. And this is especially true if the yield is high. We don't want to be trading a known profitable game state for an unknown game state, which may or may not be profitable. In other words, we ideally want to exploit as hard as possible without alerting our opponent. And this is especially true if the yield is high. So if our opponent is, let's say an extreme example, he's falling 100% of the time to three bets, so long as we three bet less than 80% of the time. Now that exploit is so valuable that we want to keep that alive. If we start three betting above 80% of the time, let's just say our opponent makes an adjustment. The problem we have is we don't know what that adjustment looks like. Maybe our opponent stops falling to any three bets. It's going to be a volatile situation because there will also be a period of time where our opponent has adjusted and we now need to scope out our opponent's adjustment. Remember what we were talking about in the opening of this podcast episode where we we're thinking about pseudo balance and how if someone does something just a small percentage of the time, it's going to be quite difficult to figure out what their exact ratio or frequency is because it takes a large sample size. So when our opponent does adjust to our overly aggressive exploitation, there's going to be a period of time where we don't quite know what our opponent's doing. We might convince ourselves that we can preempt the type of adjustment that our opponent is going to make, but really that might just be us thinking that we're better at leveling or understanding our opponent's psychology than we really are. It's very difficult to predict exactly how our opponent is going to respond. And assuming we can't predict it, it means we need to simply play a lot of volume and analyze what that new game state is. That's a lot of extra work. That's a long period of time with unknown profitability. So you can see why if we have a high yielding game state where our opponent is consistently folding money to us, it's actually in our interest to maintain that and potentially not push the exploit as hard as we could possibly and provoke a change in game state. Now, I like to imagine that there are some exceptions to this. So what we're really talking about is potentially passing up an exploit that appears to be plus EV in a vacuum, but actually ends up being minus EV when we consider future game state. So we're not doing something that's directly minus EV. What we're discussing now in terms of changing game states doesn't appear to give us free license to make minus EV decisions at the poker table. So to give an example, bluff catching against an opponent who doesn't really bluff, just so that they see that we're willing to call them light so they don't bluff us too much in the future. At the end of the day, this player is already not bluffing very much. And the way that we exploit that is simply to fold a lot when our opponent bets. So put simply, taking direct minus EV options is not okay. Now let's think about an example application of this. And this is a real life practical application of this concept. And if you think about river falling frequencies in certain spots, there are situations, depending on the river spot, where the player pool is overfolding. And we're not just talking about low and mid stakes pools, we're talking about high stakes pools as well. There are situations on the river where we can bluff any two cards profitably. So we have a choice. 
Good morning, and thanks for letting me cut into this episode. Hopefully, you're enjoying it thus far. I just wanted to let you know that if you want to go even further with these concepts, our course Deviate is going to be right up your alley. The entire course aims to do two major things. First, we identify ways in which our opponents deviate from solver-approved GTO play, and second, we take those results to determine how you can most profitably deviate from GTO to punish your opponent's deviations. Yeah, sounds like a little bit of a mouthful, but I assure you this is 100% necessary to bridge that gap between GTO and purely exploitative play. All the material in this course is backed by solver work and also population data, so you can clearly see where and why you should be making these deviations. To learn more about this course and enroll today, go to redchippoker.com slash deviate, D-E-V-I-A-T-E. -E. Again, redchippoker.com slash deviate, or click the link in the description box. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know about this course, but I'll let you get back to today's episode. Enjoy. So we have a choice. We could always fire every single air combo we get to the river with, or we could give the player pool a bit more respect and play aggressively, but try and fly below some radars. We can actually construct a river firing range in many river situations where we show up with a bluff 70% of the time. But you imagine doing that in a high stakes population and keep in mind that GTO says we should be bluffing somewhere around 25 to 30%, depending on the river bet sizing. Well, that's something that could potentially be quite easily exploited by very advanced players. Whereas instead of bluffing 25 to 30% of the time, we deliberately target the exploit there and try and bluff the river more than we should, but we bluff 50% of the time. So we have a one-to-one -one bluff to value ratio in this river spot. It's heavily exploitative, but it's pseudo balanced. We haven't pushed things to the maximum. We haven't fired every single air combo. We're just doing it very aggressively. Another way I like to think about this is that there is a line between exploitable and ridiculously exploitable. So when we have a one-to-one -one buff to value ratio on the river, that's exploitable, but it's fine because we're doing it for exploitative reasons. When we are bluffing 70% of the time when we fire the river, that's now ridiculously exploitable. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to exploit that. Again, it's like the person who never bluffs the river ever under any circumstances. That's ridiculously exploitable. It's too easy to exploit. Whereas the player who bluffs the river 10% of the time, well, that's still very exploitable, but we actually have to start thinking very carefully about what our opponent's exact frequency is because we won't know it's exactly 10% until we play quite a bit of volume. Now, it may appear on first hearing that this information actually violates one of the fundamental theorems of poker, and that is that we should always be taking the highest EV option. And this hasn't changed. We're still talking about taking the highest EV option. The difference here is that we are expanding the scope of our EV calculations to factor in time rather than just folding frequencies and bet sizings. So if we imagine that our opponent who we've been bluffing a lot of rivers against is at a place where if we bluff any more aggressively than we are, he's going to make an adjustment. And let's just say for simplicity's sake that that adjustment is going to be minus EV for us. Now on the last hand, the point where we cross that threshold, where we're now playing too aggressively, well, that hand in a vacuum is still plus EV because our opponent is still falling at an overly high frequency. But the following hand will have a much lower expectation. And that's because our opponent has decided at that point that we're pushing him too hard and he's going to be making a counter adjustment. So we are still talking about the max EV decision. The idea behind future EV is that it's an EV calculation with an expanded scope that takes into account possible changing game states. So instead of just looking at falling frequencies and bet sizings, we're making an estimate in terms of how hard can we push a certain exploit and yet still maintain the current profitable game state. Now, the problem with estimating future states is that it is an estimate. We can't say with a high degree of certainty exactly how our opponent is going to adjust if he perceives he is being exploited, and also at what point. If we three bet our opponent's opens 50% of the time, will he adjust? What if it's 70? What if we can do it 80% and he doesn't realize? Where is the breaking point where our opponent decides he's being exploited and our exploits are no longer flying below his radar? We don't know. It's an estimate. That estimate may change based on opponent type. Now, this is why it's very comfortable to confine EV calculations to the vacuum of an individual hand 
because we can often be much more explicit about the parameters involved. We can see what the bet sizing is. We maybe have some population data or HUD stats in our opponent to see what the falling frequency is. It's easy. The problem with EV calculations that factor in future play and changing game states is that there are a lot more estimates involved. And maybe that makes players uncomfortable making use of estimates. Maybe it's no longer a real EV calculation if there are estimates involved as opposed to known tangible numbers. But realistically, estimated numbers should not make us uncomfortable as poker players. Think about something like implied odds. That's based on estimates. It's based on how often our opponent is going to pay us off when we hit. So really estimation is an important part of establishing what our expected value is going to be. Now I would say that there is some stylistic preference involved here. And the reason why I say that is because I've embraced both approaches to some extent over my career. And I would say that for the most part of my career, I've been player one, which is always push the vacuumed exploit and just embrace any volatility that occurs. So someone's folding 90% of the time to a three bet, we just three bet them every time because we are analyzing our EV in a vacuum and every individual hand, our opponent's folding 90% of the time. So we just carry on three betting. Now, at some point that may provoke a change, but as we mentioned earlier in this podcast episode, don't underestimate the number of players who are just non-adjusting out there. So as a hint, we should probably be pushing exploits very hard and assuming that we can get away with that against most opponents. But the idea is EV is not really vacuumed. And at some point when we are three betting our opponent 100% of the time, there's a chance that we're going to generate some kind of response from our opponent. And it's going to be a volatile response in the sense that although it might be well-defined in our opponent's mind, we don't necessarily know what he's doing. We just know he's changed his game plan. So we've shifted from a known comfortable environment where we have a consistent exploit to an unknown environment where we no longer know what the correct exploit is. And we need that period of time to scope out our opponent's new strategy. So although yes, every individual hand in a vacuum was played at maximum expectation, it does not look like we've maximized the expectation of our overall strategy when we also consider the passage of time and changing game states. Now, it doesn't mean it's wrong to play like that. This is why I say it's a stylistic preference. You can be that guy who always pushes exploits to the max and just try and deal with the volatility as it arises. But what I've come to realize is that since that volatility is often not that predictable, even if players claim they can predict and preempt how their opponent is going to respond, there's not really any good data to suggest that that's really true. And it's just something that exists in players' minds. And this is why it might be a good idea to think more carefully about the concept of pseudo balance. Because the idea is we are already in an environment where we know what the best exploit is. And if we can maintain that, our life is so much easier. We are simply using the same strategy over and over again. We are doing it very aggressively, just not to the point where our opponent realizes what's going on. If We can maintain that game state. It's going to be a lot easier to consistently make money. It's like having a golden goose every so often it lays an egg. Whereas if you kill a golden goose or you sell the golden goose, well, now you need to find a whole new system for making money. And it might seem to some extent like this whole pseudo balance system is maybe the opposite of correct poker theory, but it's not when you think about it in more detail. For example, pseudo balance is very similar to the way that the solver plays when you give a node lock to the solver. The solver does play exploitatively, but it plays exploitatively only to an extent. It plays as exploitatively as possible without allowing villain to generate a counter exploit on the later streets, on the decision nodes that aren't locked in the solve. And this is exactly what pseudo balance is. It's playing as aggressively as possible, but not while preventing counter exploitation in a GTO sense, but more on an individual opponent level because our opponent doesn't yet realize that they are being counter exploited. So it's still the max exploit, but it's the max exploit when we think about time as a factor in that calculation as well. It's the max exploit because it can be maintained and can result in consistent profits to our win rate. 
All right. Thanks very much for listening, guys. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Poker Podcast.